Okay. Okay, here I am again. Now we're uh, time traveling uh, forward 100 years to the uh, 18th century. And I am dressed again as though I had just arrived in my car. I'm dressed very simply. You might be setting up your equipment. You might have to bend over, put up a pop-up tent or your colonial tent, unload your gear. And now I'm ready to get into my outfit. It's pretty important when you arrive at an event not to be too disruptive to the look of the event or to the other people who might already be set up. So the simple part is the better part. Now, I'm, first I'm going to just take off my vest and I, I don't need to put on a shift for this outfit. The shift being the undergarment, which in the 1600s was called the smock and it's the one that ladies wore underneath everything. If I'm just coming for the day, I just all I need to do is get dressed in the outer layer. So in taking off my vest, um, I could, if it were really cold, add um, a merino wool or a soft wool underlayer like this. This just adds for more insulation when it's really bitter cold. But for now, I am going to first put on um, a scarf of some sort. This one is just a simple cotton. It's a rectangle folded into a triangle. And I'm just going to put it on over my neck. Now these can come in any size. There are great big ones that I use that are, you know, four feet or, or more on a side turned into a triangle. They wrap around you and you can tuck them into your waistband. This one's a little smaller. It doesn't really matter with what I'm wearing today because I'll be quite well covered up. Now the next thing I'm going to put on is my petticoat. Again, like the last video, this petticoat is made in two halves. It's got slits on the side for the pockets, which I'm not going to bother with today because this is only a day event. So it has a front and a back. The front, again, is exactly the same as the previous one. It has a pleat in the front. And in the back, you can tell the pleat goes inverted, so you can tell which is the front and the back by the, by the big one not showing. This particular fabric is also wool. It's, it's quite heavy. It's the heaviest that you can wear without having stays to pin, in, pin into. It is a remnant that I got uh, from a friend and it had uh, some holes in it that I patched. So it's very typical for something like this to be a really, um, you know, common wear in the, in the, in the, 1700s you didn't let anything go to waste you used everything so I'm stepping into my petticoat tying it on the same as I did in the previous one then this one I have the ties I can tie my scarf in just a touch so it doesn't go anywhere while I'm getting dressed and the bigger the scarf the more you get to tie in and then I I center I'm not wearing pockets today but that is appropriate for the uh, 18th century, for 1700s, everybody had pockets to put their stuff in. Um, if you're just doing a parade or not needing them, you don't need them to, to uh, all the time. But the pocket slips, slits do align on the sides, and if you have pockets in your pants, you can get into your pants pockets. So tying this, this one, I didn't make the ties long enough to also come all the way around to the front. So I have to manage to tie them in the back. Okay, got the back tied on. And now for the jacket. This jacket is also a remnant. It was leftover material from a man's coat, uh, probably a military coat. It's wool. It is made us on a, a derivation of the J.P. Ryan jacket pattern. It has the side seams coming up into the shoulder area. Um, they provide shaping. It has a slit up the middle of the back, and I don't know if you can see with the dark navy that it is trimmed in a black wool braid. That means you don't have any extra thickness for the seams that would normally hold the lining and the fabric together. The good wool broadcloth from 18th century would have been cut, uh, easily cut on the edge, left untended, uncovered, and unhemmed without fraying. Modern bra cloth is not quite so sturdy. So in this case, I have trimmed the bottom everywhere with the braid. Now the lining, this is typical for something that would have been done in um, a period where 
the uh, resources were not as available. I have used some silk lining for the middle of the back and then I had some leftover purple silk lining that I did this panel and the sleeves. So nobody sees the inside of a jacket. That's where you use all your little leftover bits. And being that it's silk, it's much easier to get in and out than it is for the linen lining. Uh, so this one uh, is pretty much the similar jacket to the one I had on for the 1600s. It has a higher collar than regular for uh, most, many of the women's jackets are cut lower, like about, like about here. But this pattern it is a combination, as I said, of J.P. Ryan jacket pattern. And I took a few details off of a riding habit, like the little dart here. And it's, it's not pinned together, it's fastened down the front with hooks and eyes, which are period correct. And I've left a little extra room here at the top for an even thicker scarf. I made this jacket extra loose so that I could loan it out to friends and I could layer up underneath it. And it's also not so period correct for the 18th century as to be not wearable today. It does have a little bit of a flare on the back. And as I turn around, you can see that it is nice and ample. It's easy to work in. I can move around. Typical uh, jackets from the 18th century for women were so tight that you really couldn't do much physical work. You couldn't be setting up your tent. You couldn't be bending over cooking. Um, they were very tight jackets, and that's why many women like to wear the bed gown or a short gown or something that is a little looser or something that just ties around. This one is a little more tailored. And, and it suits well. It's uh, These are colors that would have been suitable. And now for the last layer that I would wear here, um, I'm going to put on a cap. This is the typical cap. These are very inexpensive. You can get them from JAS Townsend. You can make them yourself. And they just go on over your hair. And, they, and the biggest thing here for this era is to tuck your hair up inside. Even if you have to put a second scarf on, no bangs. And I put comb in the top and usually a comb in the back to keep it from blowing off in the wind. There is another cap that is common for the era. And um, this is a country, called a country cap. It has a ruffle around the edge. It fits also on top of your head with room for your hair in the back. And you can tie it under your chin or you can tie it behind you and behind the back of your neck. Um, this cap is also very common and it, it often is worn by children as well. A couple other things that I have. This is a spotted scarf. This could go in place of the plain scarf. Uh, they were very period correct for the, um, the 18th century. And oh, I have one here that's just a little more decorative. This one I put, it's a, a, a cotton organdy. Um, it's quite stiff so it holds its shape and I put just a little trim around the edge. Now for the footwear I have on the same shoes that I traveled into the event in with my um, my 1600s outfit, but I might trade them out for these shoes, which are period correct. They have a brass buckle here, they lap over the top and you can adjust them. They are leather soled. Um, one of the issues with a leather soled shoe is that they do wear out. So. Um, you can have them resold, and when they resold them, sometimes they actually put on a rubber sole rather than a leather sole. These shoes I've only had for a year, and they're about half worn out. So that is um, also something you can change out, or how many layers of socks you wear. These are long socks, and I have black wool socks on under here. They're fairly short, and you can also fit under there any sort of a black, plain black sock or a um, there are many period correct socks available that will suit you no matter what the weather. So that's it for my attire for a simple camp wear for the uh, 18th century. Well, I'd like to thank you for watching our Daughters of Liberty videos. We now have a whole collection on YouTube that span all the women's crafts and different colonial costuming from the uh, 18th century. Um, we just today 
went into the 1600s for the first time. And right now I'd like to say there's also an opportunity for those who participate in the 1800s fur trade and mountain man um, sorts of events, the Pacific Primitives out here in Washington State. There are lots of events uh, for muzzle loaders. Then the women go along as well. They also need their period correct attire. And what I was showing for the event for the events of the 18th century also works for fur trade um, and maybe even later. It's simple, it's a petticoat, it's a jacket, and once again the 1600s hat, which is just a wool hat that's gotten wet and relaxed, works just fine for that period too. So I hope that a lot of you will think about coming to our colonial festival that celebrates uh, the end of the colonial era. Uh, from 1775 onwards. It is held at the Port Angeles um, George Washington Inn and Estate and Washington Lavender Farm. It will be the second week of August, August 11th to the 14th this summer and we will have all sorts of opportunities for people to try out their new reenacting skills, period dress, or for children to come and learn about the activities of that era. There will be military demonstrations, skirmishes, drills, and all sorts of crafts on display. So please come see us then, and thank you for watching.